And at ReviewCon, which is what we're calling a thing where we get together with our hardcore friends and play hardcore games, we played a lot of board games. We're trying to review all of them before we forget about them. Yes. <laughs> and one of the games we played was entirely new to me. I'd never seen it before in my life. I had never seen it. But the, I had bo- never the played box it. was appealing. It is just called Luna. Uh, but apparently has an alternate name. The full name is Luna in the Domain of the Moon Princess, which I guess... Is definitely accurate. It's been published by a bunch of different companies, but it was Z-Man at one point. This is not a apparently very successful game. It's never became a big hit. I don't think if you asked most board game people about it, only the super nerdiest would know. And my shortest possible assessment of it is that I have not encountered a game that is specifically like it. It combines... The it's, it's definitely a unique game, it combines but it is not so amazing and that to make it into like a great game that you want to play a whole bunch, but it's also not a bad game. It's not like, oh, this poopy game. It's just like it's not super great amazo game like, say, Power Grid or some Puerto Rico or something. Yep. But it's a game that I want. It's very unique and therefore worth care, worth pay, playing if you're someone who cares about board games. Now you that's your TLDR. You can stop listening and then now we'll talk about the actual game. But I would play it again because... An I interest, would play it again. An interesting thing about it is that having played it once... The interrelations between the purely deterministic actions of the players is more complex than one might expect. Oh, yeah. Meaning, playing it again, I may take drastically different actions from the first time I played. Mm -hmm. And despite that, despite that complexity, the first time we played it, the scores were pretty close, and people developed wildly different directional heuristics that seemed to converge. Yeah, so... First of all, this game is fascinating in that it is a perfect information game. Yeah. There is, I, there's no cards in your hand. There's no secret. There's no deck of things flipping up. There's no nothing. It's literally just like, all right, everyone move your dudes. Yep, move <laughs> them around on these islands in a, right. a crooked, slightly middle, so worker placement game. In the middle of the map, in the middle of the game, there's this big uh, hex map thing uh, which contains the moon princess's castle. The Moon Princess never goes there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you can go there to pray to the Moon Princess uh, and get a lot of victory points, apparently. <laughs> and all around the Moon Princess's castle are these islands. You know, it's funny because that middle part reminds me of the castle from uh, Kalis in that it's the most prominent thing on the board and it seemed to be the true end game once people are reasonably skilled. Yes. Uh, all around the castle are these islands and each island has a different purpose, right? There's like an observatory... And uh, I forget what all the different islands are. There's a bunch of them. And they, so all, they all do something different. Physically separate islands with a, a token that is yeah, action. Look, separate little cardboard islands that are you know look like islands. And on each island, there is a token that is specific to that island that you can basically spend an action to take. And then you'll be able to use that later to do something. Independently of that, there is a moon priestess who moves from island to island in a deterministic fashion. Having more dudes on an island when she's there is worth victory points. And there's also this jerk who's going around the other direction, and you don't want to be on the island when he's there. Mm -hmm. And you basically, on your turn, you allocate What if he's on the island with the moon princess? Well, that was an interesting situation that caused everyone to scatter to the winds. (laughs) Priestess, princess, I don't know. Yeah, the theme... like the. Tying the theme to the game is pretty thin, similarly to how the theme of village seems like it fits the game mechanics, but doesn't yeah. really when you yeah. dig into it. So, so I basically ignored the theme. Right. So the first thing about this game that you'll no- I noticed right away as soon as the rules were explained, that I didn't even need to play one turn of the game to realize this, is that you get some meeples and moving them is a pain in the ass. Yep, you want a huge. As soon as they explain the rules, I'm like, God damn, it's going to be hard to move these guys around. The whole game is going to be really about moving these guys and getting like, them moved to where I need them to be. So think of it kind of like when two people are having a fist fight mm-hmm. in that if they're high-level martial arts masters, the act of moving your body in a way to then punch someone is itself a telegraphing of what direction you're, like what kind of thing you're about to do. Yep. You got to set up moves well in advance in a public space where everyone can see what you're setting up. Yeah, so like you want to you wanna move your meeple, you can move it barely and it costs like a whole action and it sucks. And, and then, then they, everyone sees what you did and goes, huh. And, and the, guy, they, the guy's like spent and the meeple can't do anything anymore because you moved it, right? You can move them way better 
if you get a boat, but to get a boat, you got to go to the island that has boats on it and take a boat tile. And now everyone sees that you took a boat tile. So you're basically really, when you do that, you're just delaying your action to get a better action later. Now, I did find that a useful heuristic was by having any tile in front of you kind of scared other people from committing to actions that tile could fuck up. Yes. And that beca- so posturing became a big part of the game, which is why, even though they are so different that I would not compare them otherwise, and I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression from this comparison, but this game shares that very strongly with Hansa Teutonica, mm. in that the game is, you can make very incremental actions on the board at significant personal cost, meaning there's a very limited number of actions you can take, yep. and... The mere act of positioning something gives other players a ton of information about what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And things that they can do now. Yep. But then when someone else puts something down, it definitely informs. So like when I see Scott's still got two guys he could put out, and I want to get the majority on the priestess, but Scott could put the guys there, so I don't know. You don't want to make a move if someone else still has the ability to disrupt that move. You wait until your move is invincible and not unthreatened, and then make it. But if everyone waits that, then you get to... Otherwise, if you commit your two movements to go see the moon priestess, and then someone else commits three, and now you, you committed your moves and you got nothing for it. Yeah, but at the same time, you got to move somewhere. Like, you got to do stuff. You, you got to play do, your you hand. You can't not do anything. You can't just posture forever. Which you, you can pass and take a candle. But then what happens is, like, sure, the board can go. Or if no one else passes, it'll come back to you, and you can do something. You, can, you don't have to keep passing. You can unpass. Now, this is what's but, crazy. This passing mechanic, and I can't stress this enough, it is very rare that when someone does something weird with a generally agreed upon mechanic in games, usually that's bad, Mm -hmm. like in Ground Floor. Yep. I kind of like this candle mechanic, but I guarantee if you're not careful, you're going to explain it wrong or do it wrong. I was not uh, properly educated on this rule when we started, and I- Which was your own fault, because it was explained like five times. But it was, it's a a non-standard passing mechanic, which is why I saw my eyes didn't pay, I I glazed over when it was being explained. Uh, But basically, there's four or five candle tiles, how many? Some number. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. It might be the number of players. I don't know. Uh, but anyway. if you four, pa- four, four, four. If you pass, you take a candle tile, and the candle starts to burn out, right? And then you, when, if, it, if the game gets her back around to you and the candle still hasn't burnt out, you can obviously pass again. You can also take an action. But right? passing again takes another candle. So it's not like right. most games, if they have this kind of mechanic, it's usually, either... Usually when you pass, you're out, out, out for, for the rest of the round or something. Nope, not in this game. As yep. long as this candle, you can keep going. Now, the other alternative way that goes is people can pass, and if they're not permanently out, they can unpass, and the other way games tend to do this is the round only ends if everyone passes once in a it's row. It's like, nope, there just needs to be the candle has to burn out. One person could take all the candle pieces, and that would burn it out. So Obviously, that I person pass, would Scott take- takes an action, Chris takes Nathan. Action, I pass again. Now everyone goes, oh, shit. Right. It's like you can basically take candle, burn the candle out as your action to sort of threaten people and to realize, oh, shit, I might not get another action now. Crap, <laughs> the candle has burnt this much. Uh, we didn't learn that till much later in the game, but knowing now what I know... You keep saying we. It was just you. You were the only one confused. If I had understood confused. that better, the next time I play this game, there's going to be a lot of rounds where I'm just like, Candle? That's fine. All right, go. Especially because if you take Candle early, it just it sort of puts a timer on everyone else. Yeah, it makes them take an action for me to respond to instead of me taking the first action and putting myself at disadvantage. So there's this worker placement game, which has a, part of the reason why we're not getting into the specific mechanics of all these things. I forget them. I played the game once, and it was a while ago. They're kind of immaterial to the review, and there's a lot of them, and they don't make sense unless we literally teach you the whole game. Yeah, but basically each island has a tile. The tiles can do things, but you have to sort of move a guy to a place, get a tile, then use the tile. It's very slow, and you're telegraphing everything that you can or, or might do. The main thing is the middle of the board where the hexes are. I would, so it's, we say the main thing, but really it's more like the end game? Sort like, of. It's the goal, but really the goal you is victory get, points. You get these treasures by claiming them, and then you put them into the middle, and they're worth points, and you can also bump people out of the middle that are adjacent to you by attacking. That is not what the fiction is. I don't care what the fiction is. Yeah, but no. But the mechanic of this is pretty unique. You can also lock your guys in and prevent them from being bumped. So you've got to... Yeah, but that's one of those tile actions. Yep. So basically, you've got this hex area, and there is a limited number 
of the treasure type things where the numbers just count up. There's higher and higher numbers. It's and all you, deterministic. And you can only, cl- but you can spend actions to claim one and spend actions to put them into the castle. Mm-hmm. If someone puts a higher numbered one next to one of yours with a lower number, your guy gets fucked basically yep he's kicked out and he goes to a special place where he can't even do normal movement he has to use one of those boats to get out yeah you have to use a crappy move you have to get an extra action and like use a bunch of resources to rescue that guy now because he's stuck on the dock of the castle it's real bad if it happens to you yep but you can only take numbers so high there was a notable turn where i saw rim was in a vulnerable position and i basically was just like waiting and hoping rim would do this and then he yep. did it and then i went yeah i did it all right so remember the provost in Kalis that would sort of move along to sort of set boundaries for what you can do yep so there's there's a mechanic like the provost and that every turn this thing moves further down this track Re- uh, activating more of the treasure yes unlocking and, higher numbers of treasure and bringing you closer to the end game the earlier you move in you can get points for moving in but now you've got guys that are vulnerable that could be kicked out for the end of the game but moving in late is hard one of the worker things you can do is get a tile that will let you skip one level ahead of that provost yep and all that combined makes a pretty complex mechanic that you could build an entire game around. Mm-hmm. And yet... This is the sub-game of getting victory points within the game of doing stuff with these islands. So, pretty much, if I hadn't read these rules and played this game, this game reeks of a game that would fail in the way that Ground Floor failed. In that it has multiple mechanics that are like known mechanics, but are crooked in a way that is not commonly known, meaning they're easy to mess up, coupled with having multiple significantly complex mechanics in the same game that are not obviously and directly interrelated, and yet they work pretty well together. Yeah, it's it's weird. There's a lot of games like this out there. I remember playing a lot of them back in like the RIT days. Where like there's these really sort of semi-unique euros that have things and mechanics that are like really different from every other kind of game. Like Village is actually a recent example of a game that felt that way. Yeah, Village with the people dying and going in the like. There's no other game that does that, right? Um, and that sort of makes me personally want to play them, but it doesn't make me want to like. It makes me want to play them a few times, right? Cause, and then sort of like that novelty is the is the thing the game has going for it because really. The game to play is mostly kind of frustrating with all these limited actions. But at the it's same time, it's not like a super fun time. But like Tikal, it's just Mexico, know, Java have that same thing. What was the joke we always said? The way they figure out how many actions you get in those games is to keep reducing the number by one until a fist fight breaks out in the playtesters, right. and then add one and leave it there. But yeah. It's like it's not a f- super fun to play, and the theme isn't that exciting, even though Moon Priest is pretty cool, right? But but it was intellectually stimulating and difficult, and I enjoyed my experience such that I want to play it again. Yeah, I want to play it a few times, but I wouldn't want to buy it or play it a whole bunch or make it my favorite game or give it... It's not like a great game that deserves awards or anything like that. You know, it's just like this totally unique, weird, still good thing that someone who is way into board games... Uh, should definitely check out for a you know different experience, but you know obviously doesn't have the mass. It, you know I I don't want to say it doesn't deserve mass market, uh, you know I guess sales, but it doesn't have mass market sales, so it's, it has what it deserves. But it feels very. I felt good about the decisions I was making. Decisions I made mattered a lot most of the time. You don't get a lot of them. That's why. Yep. But the one thing it lacks is that because it's got some fairly complex mechanics all sort of interoperating, it doesn't have the sort of, I don't know, simplistic elegance of Hansa Teutonica, which has a very similar reactive and posturing component. Mm. So I want to play this two or three more times, and it's possible that I would enjoy it beyond that, but I'm not sure because I don't know if the game will lock into either a degenerate strategy among among significant analysis or a sort of very steady state, like there is only one clear way to win and everyone's just racing to do it. So we'll see. Mm. Uh, But I liked it, and I haven't played a game like it, and I think you should at least, if you see it at a con, you should definitely take it out of the library and play it. But I would not buy it sight unseen. No, I definitely, it's one of those games you see in a convention library, you can be like, what the hell is that? And if you ever say that about a game, 
Play it at least one time. Yeah. Like there's that mermaid game in the PAX library. I don't know what the hell that yeah. is, but I really want to play it one time. But I guess this game I think has it a- actually might have gotten culled. I don't know. This game has a lot of meat to it, more meat than you might expect. And despite having the trappings of the kinds of things that make me very wary of a game, it actually executed on those things. Also, I was impressed it's, a, by that. it's a perfect information game, so don't neglect that fact. There's not a lot of perfect information games out there. And the ones So if you want a game that has no randomness, no secrets, no bluffing, and really, you know, a lot more like chess, only obviously more Euro style, uh, this is one to look at because there aren't many in that category. The perfect information games that have these kinds of mechanics tend to devolve very rapidly into this is the only clear path to victory. Or usually they're abstract like Oshi. Yeah, but this one, I'm really curious if after two or three more plays, there is a very clear sequence to victory. Probably. Or, yeah, I don't know. Other games that I have played that I would have made the same sort of question about definitely devolve very rapidly. This one, at the end of our first play, I didn't have a path yet. Mm. And that is notable to me. Because mm-hmm. usually I find that path and I don't ever want to play the game again. I actually do want to play this game again. And you know us on Geek Nights, wanting to play a game again is one of the highest pieces of phrase we can ever give to a game. Sure. It's like play once, play more than once, play forever. Those are the three levels you got. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. 